that was where we found um, what became uh, the means and method to explain to the jury where these two people were in the course of a year and a half of putting together um, the, both their plan and the components necessary to, to uh, execute it. Murder. The unlawful killing of another living, breathing human being. Or, as was the case on April 19, 1995, on a cool, crisp spring morning in downtown Oklahoma City, 168 living, breathing human beings. On this season of A Murderous Design, we'll study what may be the largest circumstantial evidence trial ever heard in an American courtroom, the United States of America versus Timothy James McVeigh. Based on the authentic trial transcripts and interviews with those who tried the case, we will uncover the author responsible for the formation and execution of A Murderous Design. I'm Brandon Birmingham. This is Timothy James McVeigh versus the USA. And so we got to talk to the jury about a man who would design this crime. Our theory was the ninth victim was the bomber. The truth is uh, we had no on the ground ID of anybody uh, known Tim McVeigh at that time. Through Murrah's autopsy, we've established how investigators identified the key feature of the case, the unique weapon. In order for jurors to believe that McVeigh was guilty, they would necessarily have to believe that he knew how to compose that bomb, possessed and or had access to its components, and that he knew how to use them. You will recall that Lori mentioned a light blue book McVeigh used to learn the proper detonation ratios. Dana Rogers was the chief financial officer at the Paladin Press. They distributed books about military science, martial arts, and police science and self-defense. They also used catalogs to show off their inventory, and in March of 1992, a customer named Timothy McVeigh ordered two books. The first was Ragnar's Big Book of Homemade Weapons for $25. The second was called Homemade C4, a recipe for survival for 10 A copy of the table of contents from the latter was introduced to the jurors, reads as follows. Chapter 1, Ammonium Nitrate. Chapter 2, Nitromethane. Chapter 3, Home Manufacturer of C4. Chapter 4, The Finished Product. An excerpt from the catalog from Ragnar's Big Book was also introduced to jurors. Quote, Although fertilizer-grade ammonium nitrate can usually be purchased from nurseries and garden supply stores, a better source for explosive manufacture is farm supply stores. The explosives made by mixing ammonium nitrate with nitromethane seems to possess all the desirable characteristics of high-grade military explosives. If you used anhydrous hydrazine with that ammonium nitrate, you're going to have the most powerful chemical explosive known to man, short of an actual atomic reaction, end quote. The FBI, they tracked down that receipt. Fingerprint expert Louis Hupp the same that individualized McVeigh's prints on the documents in that Mercury, also determined that two of the fingerprints from the receipt for those two books belong to Tim McVeigh. Now, to be clear, Ragnar's books do not advocate for or instruct how to build a bomb out of a Ryder truck, and those books have been widely circulated for years, and not everyone who has brought one of those books has done what McVeigh was accused of doing. It's one thing to read about the book and follow the recipes for the small explosives contained therein, it's quite another to extrapolate to compile large qualities of those explosive components. And the next constellation of witnesses was offered to prove that McVeigh did just that, sought out and procure bomb-making components. Gregory Pfaff worked at Lock and Load Distributors. They bought and sold explosive tip ammunition, tracers, and incendiary devices at gun shows. This is how he knew McVeigh. 
McVeigh called him and asked him for a detonation cord, or known as debt cord for short. It's a high-speed fuse composed chiefly of PETN, pentarithrotol tetranitrate, used for detonating high explosives. Pfaff told McVeigh he might be able to get one, but that he couldn't ship it within the United States. McVeigh told him he was willing to drive all the way from Arizona to New York to get it. Ten days later, McVeigh called back and asked him for the cord. When Pfaff told him he wasn't able to get it, McVeigh abruptly hung up. Next to testify was David Darlack. He worked at a sign shop in Buffalo, New York called NAS Signs, N-A-S. Before that, he worked at a place in Tonawanda, New York called Rosewood Signs on two different occasions from 86 to 88 and 92 to 95. And in between, he served in the United States Army. Before all that, he was high school friends with Timothy McVeigh. In 1994, McVeigh phoned him, he told jurors, asking if he could get some racing fuel. He said no and asked McVeigh why he needed racing fuel. McVeigh wouldn't answer, and two days later, McVeigh left a message on the answering machine and said, forget about the racing fuel. Gary Masato lived in Kansas, and over the years, he owned and mechanic race cars. Those types of cars use a special racing fuel made up of nitromethane. And in 1994, he told jurors he received a phone call from a man who identified himself as Gary. Gary asked if he had any nitromethane. He said that he didn't. He told the caller that a guy named Glenn Tipton with VP Racing Fuels might be able to help. Masato also told the caller about a big NHRA race held in Topeka at the Heartland Park in October. One item was definitely being sold there was nitromethane. The last weekend of September 1994, a slender man with a narrow face and jawline with two to three days of growth walked up to Glenn Tipton at a racetrack in Topeka and asked about a pure form of rocket fuel called anhydrous hydrazine and another more common fuel called nitromethane. The man was in luck. Tipton did sell racing fuel, the chief component of which was nitromethane. He told the slender man he would have to check on whether he could get a 55-gallon drum of the anhydrazine, however, and asked the man for his number. The slender-faced man said he didn't have a phone, so Tipton gave him one of his business cards that had that number on it. A week later, a man called the number on the business card and asked whether he was able to get a hold of the anhydrazine they spoke about previously. Tipton told him he could not, and the conversation ended. One thing stuck out to Tipton about this conversation, though. In all the years he worked races and sold fuel like he did that day in Topeka, that was the only time a customer ever asked about anhydrazine and nitromethane. Prosecutors asked him what would happen if those two fuels were mixed. Tipton replied, you'd create a bomb. Tipton told jurors the conclusion of his testimony that he was 90% sure that the slender-faced man inquiring about both fuels was Timothy McVeigh. Next in this series of witnesses was Timothy Chambers, who works at VP Racing Fuels, the same company as Glenn Tipton. And on October the 21st of 1994, he was working at the Chief Auto Parts National in Paul's Valley, Oklahoma, when he was approached by a man wanting to buy, quote, three drums of nitromethane. They reached a deal for the sale, and the man came back 45 minutes later, driving a faded pickup truck with a camper on the back. As they loaded the three drums into the truck, Chambers asked him why he needed all that fuel. The man explained that his friends came down every year and they, quote, raced their Harleys. The man took the fuel and a receipt and was on his way. Two things stuck out about this transaction to Chambers. The first was that the sale was very large, $2,775, and cash transactions that big are very rare. And the other thing, well, Harley riders never buy that much nitromethane. It would burn too hot and damage the engine. They buy it in much smaller quantities and they dilute it. He described the man as 5 feet 11 with sandy blonde hair, eyes too close together, and a longer-than-normal nose. Was this Timothy McVeigh? Well, Chambers told jurors he couldn't say. In March of 1997, he was shown a photo lineup containing McVeigh's picture, but he was unable to make that ID. Robert Nadier was the president and general manager of Mid-Kansas Co-op at Mound Ridge, Kansas. They sell farm supply items, including fertilizers made of anhydrous hydrazine and ammonium nitrate. And if a sale was made, the customer at one of his 19 stores throughout the Midwest would fill out a triplicate form. The store kept the yellow copy, the customer the pink, and the white copy went to the main office in Mound Ridge. Kansas law does not charge tax on the sale of some of those items, and if you were a customer and wanted to claim a tax-exempt transaction, you'd have to fill out a form. Among your identifying information, you would also swear that the purpose of your purchase was agricultural. In 1994, Mr. Nadier's company sold only one type of ammonium nitrate prills, 34-00. The 34 indicates the amount of nitrogen. The first zero is phosphate and the second potash. 
This is low-density ammonium nitrate fertilizer. And on September the 30th of 1994, the employees from his branch just off I-35 in McPherson, Kansas, made a sale of a large quantity of ammonium nitrate to a man named Mike Havens. 40 50-pound bags to be exact, a full pallet. Some total, $228.74. October the 18th, 1994, a few days later, a Mike Havens made another purchase of the same type, the same amount, 2,000 pounds, of 34-0-0 ammonium nitrate. Although both could have been tax-exempt, Havens didn't fill out the request. These two transactions were indeed peculiar for other reasons besides declining the request for the exemption. Louis Michalko is a special agent for the FBI with a background in accounting. He reviewed all the receipts that might have shown sales of ammonium nitrate in the years and months leading up to the bombing. A total of 528 of those tickets reflected ammonium nitrate sales. Of all the purchases of all the ammonium nitrate at the different branches, only Mr. Havens purchased the ammonium nitrate in cash. 80% of all transactions at the McPherson branch were made by people buying either one or two bags. Only three customers purchased a thousand bags or more from the McPherson location. Havens was one, the McPherson Golf Club, and a man named James Weens was the other. But Havens bought twice as much as they did. There were, in fact, only three sales of fertilizer of 2,000 pounds or more. Two to Havens and the other was to the golf club. If you believe Lori Fortier's account of the day Tim McVeigh used soup cans to show her the design of his bomb, he also described how he was going to use, quote, those sausage things that he and Terry Nichols had stolen from a quarry somewhere in Kansas. And while some investigators were fanning out across the country trying to connect Tim McVeigh and his accomplices to some of the chemical components of the bomb, others looked into verifying that this burglary actually happened, and if so, tying it to McVeigh. Bud Radke is a driller blaster who works for Martin Marietta Rock Company a mile and a half north of Marion, Kansas. He loads the holes he drills into the rock in order to blow them down into smaller chunks to be taken to the plant and broken down again and shipped off for use on roads and highways. Dynamite had fallen out of favor in his practice. Instead, he used an emulsion mix with a blasting cap. He'd put the mix into the holes and put the blasting cap in it, cover it up with more rock, do that several times over, then wire them all together using a, a special machine for touching it off. According to what he told jurors, the blasting cap looks like a big stick of sausage in a white plastic wrap, 16 inches long and 2 inches in diameter. These sausages are boosters needed to turn a small explosion into a much bigger one. They buy in bulk and store them in magazines on site. The magazines are about 4 to 5 feet square and are secured by two padlocks on the door to the sheds. At the beginning of October of 1994, he went to retrieve some of those blasting caps. He felt for the padlocks, but they were gone. He opened up the small storage sheds and found that six or seven cases of the 250 caps were missing. In another shed, they stored ANFO, or ammonium nitrate fuel oil mixtures. He went back and checked those padlocks. They had been, quote, drilled out and unlocked. All told, 400 pounds of those sausages were taken. Lloyd Davies worked at a funeral home, a job he'd had only for about four months by the time of the trial. But before that, he was the sheriff of Marion County, Kansas, and back on October the 3rd of 94, he investigated the burglary at the quarry. Under the locks, he found metal shavings and lock tumblers, indicating to him that whoever broke in did so by drilling the locks. Two days later, he went back to the quarry after learning the second storage shed was burglarized. He collected the padlock with the hole drilled through that keyhole and placed them both in the sheriff lockbox. Although the locks were collected, there were no viable suspects, at least not at the time. Lori Fortier also told jurors that McVeigh asked her and Michael for help in renting storage sheds. I mean, after all, if she was truthful in her testimony that McVeigh, Nichols, and her husband, Michael, were collecting various components for the bomb in the months leading up to the bombing, well, they need somewhere to keep them. Helen Mitchell is the daughter of a Lutheran minister, mother of five, and is a bookkeeper with the Clark Lumber Company. In addition to lumber, they also have storage units for rent. They are located in Harrington, Kansas, just outside of Junction City in North of Marion. On September the 22nd of 94, she rented a storage unit to a man named Sean Rivers. For the rental agreement, he gave the address of Route 3, Box 83 in Marion, Kansas. She took $80 cash from him, enough for four months' rent. About a month later, she received another payment for the same unit for four more months. 
Her customer, Mr. Rivers, had that unit paid up through May 22nd of 95. She could not identify McVeigh, Nichols, or Fortier during the trial as Sean Rivers, but she did keep those receipts. Boots you stored is attached to a gas station and convenience store called the Conoco Deli in Council Grove, Kansas. Sherry Furman does the books and sets up rental accounts for the storage sheds with customers. On October the 17th of 94, a customer named Joe Kyle rented shed number 40. As required by their rental agreement, a monthly payment was made in person. Sometime in November, a man called in giving the name of Ted Parker. The man said that he needed to rent a storage unit. The man said he was coming in from out of town and needed to meet that day. She didn't need to give the man directions because Mr. Parker, as he wished to be called, knew how to get there. They met and filled out the lease agreement for Unit 37. She collected the man's name and number. The man signed the agreement with the name Ted Parker. The address? 3616 North Van Dyke, Decker, Michigan. Phone number? 517-872-4108. Her records reflected that Unit 40 was rented up through April 1st of 95. Unit 37 was rented up through May 1st. And as Miss Furman watched the news of the bombing a few months after the rental transaction... She said she saw Ted Parker on TV. It was Terry Nichols. Jody Carlson worked for the Lincoln Properties in Kingman, Arizona, and unlike other storage shed businesses we've heard about, she actually requires a driver's license before she'll agree to the rental. On October the 4th of 94, she rented a storage unit to a Tim McVeigh. She verified his identity that day by his driver's license. She also identified him in court. It had been nearly a week since Lori Fortier testified. The preceding constellation of witnesses we've discussed gave jurors all that you've just heard. The prosecutors established that the events she described, the storage sheds and acquiring the components, had actually occurred, but the puzzle was far from complete. Through the in-court identification by Jody Carlson of McVeigh and Sherry Furman's identification of Terry Nichols, jurors might have believed that the two men rented a storage unit, but for what purpose? Lori Fortier said they were looking to rent storage facilities to store the components, but there was no evidence as of yet that they actually did so. Likewise, there was proof that the Martin Mariana Rock Company was burglarized, but no proof whatsoever that McVeigh was responsible. Finally, there was some evidence that someone bought a peculiarly large amount of ammonium nitrate and nitromethane, but there was still no proof that it was McVeigh. Who was Ted Parker, Sean Rivers, Joe Kyle, or Mike Havens? Aliases? Real people? More conspirators? Was the Tim McVeigh that ordered those books from the Paladin Press in 92 the same Tim McVeigh sitting in the defendant's chair by way of the Noble County Jail? It was time to start putting the pieces together. Recall that the address given by the Tim McVeigh who rented room number 25 at the Dreamland Motel was 3616 North Van Dyke in Decker, Michigan. That's the home of James and Terry Nichols. While the investigation that led investigators to finding McVeigh at the Noble County Courthouse was underway, other investigators chased down leads related to Terry Nichols. They learned he joined the United States Army where he befriended Timothy McVeigh. They also learned he lived in Harrington, Kansas. Investigators eventually obtained and executed search warrants for Nichols' house. It proved to be a treasure trove of evidence. One agent opened a drawer by the sink in the kitchen. She saw some dish towels and pulled the drawer out a little bit further. That's when she found a bag of coins. In the bag, she found a square piece of pink paper wrapped around some gold coins. The pink slip is a receipt from Mid-Kansas Cooperative Association dated September the 30th of 1994, for 40 50-pound bags of ammonium nitrate sold by Mr. Nattier. This is the pink customer copy, the one with the name Mike Havens we talked about before. Fingerprint examiner Louis Hupp, the one you may recall from the beginning of the trial who isolated McVeigh's prints on those documents in his car, he put a series of chemicals on the receipt with the hopes of obtaining and lifting a usable print. It worked. One of those prints belonged to Timothy McVeigh. One limitation of fingerprint evidence is the fact that it's normally impossible to tell when that print was left on the object. This receipt was dated September the 30th of 1994 and recovered in April of 95. The print could have been left at any time during that period, 
but the strength of a piece of evidence like this can be increased greatly if other circumstances shed light on when it might have been left. Agents discovered one such piece, the storage lease agreement dated 9-22-94 bearing the name Sean Rivers and address Route 3, Box 83, Marion, Kansas. This is the receipt made by Helen Mitchell, the daughter of the Lutheran minister. Fingerprint expert Hupp got a total of 10 usable prints, eight of which belonged to McVeigh. Now, two separately created pieces of evidence existed with McVeigh's prints. He must have left them on the receipts prior to the execution of the search warrant, and obviously prior to his incarceration. While it is true that the prints only prove he came into contact with those receipts, a conclusion could be drawn that he filled them out too. Either way, the prints prove he at least knew about the sheds if he didn't in fact rent them, and they connected him to Terry Nichols, and consequently, all the other evidence in the house, in the months leading up to the bombing. In cases involving co-defendants, investigators will compare all the recovered prints to all suspects, not just the one on trial, and such was the case here for Terry Nichols. One by one, key pieces of evidence were discussed with jurors, both fingerprints on the receipt from shed number 37 rented to Ted Parker at Boots U Store at matched Terry Nichols. Besides fingerprint-yielding evidence, investigators recovered other evidence prosecutors hoped to further connect McVeigh and his accomplices with the crime. Agent Nellis found a picture of McVeigh and Nichols in a photo album. Agent Jasnowski found four 55-gallon white plastic barrels. She also found a notebook containing a page with the words Joe Kyle number 40, C-O-U-N slash G-R slash K-A-N 1017. In addition, there was another one found, Ted Parker 111794, along with, quote, 131.95. Both appeared to be the reminder notes about the length of time of the rental agreements for storage sheds, the ones in Council Grove. Finally, Agent Tucker found a box with six bottles containing a white substance. The bottles had various labels, ammonium nitrate, fertilizer, and prills. These were collected and stored for future analysis. Agent Brown collected a Makita cordless drill in a blue box and drill bits from a yellow box. You will recall that the locks guarding the sausage-type explosives apparently damaged by a drill were recovered by Sheriff Davies in Marion County, Kansas. That case, the Corey burglary, might just be solved after all. James Cadigan works in the firearms and toolmark unit at the FBI laboratory, a job he'd been doing for 20 years. Toolmark comparison experts like him compare physical marks left on evidence recovered from a crime scene with tools or instruments recovered elsewhere in order to determine whether the suspected tool made the suspected mark. For example, in a burglary in which a crowbar is used to pry open a window, a tool mark expert could analyze the mark on the window and the window sill and compare it with marks made by a crowbar to determine whether or not the mark left on the window sill during the burglary could have been made by that crowbar. The analyst begins by studying the class characteristics, the measurements and components that all the instruments of that type share. A crowbar, for example, may be one and a half inches in width. That is a characteristic of all crowbars in that class. The next step would be to identify and analyze gross imperfections in a specific instrument like chips, cracks, or other unique indentations. The instrument is thus compared to a mark and the expert forms their opinion about whether the instrument did make, did not make, or could not be eliminated from making the mark. His job in this case was to compare the padlock recovered from the quarry by Sheriff Davies with a drill bit recovered from Terry Nichols' house. He first determined that the hole in the padlock was created by a quarter-inch bit. This is a class characteristic, meaning he could eliminate all recovered bits that were not quarter-inch. In this case, that left only two quarter-inch drill bit candidates recovered from Nichols' basement. He put those two candidates in the recovered drill and drilled holes in sample pieces of lead. He then compared those drill marks from the lead to the drill marks in the padlock under a comparison microscope, a a microscope with two different optical bridges, comparing them side by side. His conclusion based on the microscopically observed lines, striations, and scratches, well, one of the quarter-inch drill bits recovered from Terry Nichols' basement is the drill bit used to drill a hole in the padlock recovered from the shed used to store ammonium nitrate at the quarry. Jurors learned of one final connection between the quarry burglary and evidence recovered from Terry Nichols' house, this treasure trove. Agent Tongate found five rolls of 60-foot Primadet non-electric blasting caps. The caps were the same type taken from the quarry and were encased in the same orange tubing as those taken from the quarry. And with that, the prosecutors concluded their presentation of evidence recovered 
from Terry Nichols' house. The next witness lived with her father in Lockport, New York. It's the town in which she grew up. She attended bar on the weekends and studied elementary education at Buffalo State College. Her name is Jennifer, and she has a sister named Patty. And she was being called to testify that the handwriting on certain documents related to the bombing belonged to her brother, Timothy McVeigh. Prosecutors offered them to show planning, design, and motive. We'll start with Paulson's military supply card, the one found by Trooper Hanger in his squad car after he arrested and transported McVeigh 77 miles outside of Oklahoma City the morning of the bombing. The handwriting that she said belonged to McVeigh, you'll recall on the back of that card it said TNT, five sticks, needs more, call after 1st of May, see if I can get some more, end quote. She also identified the handwriting on the sign recovered from the car in which McVeigh was driving when he pulled over that read, quote, not abandoned, please do not tow, will move by April 23rd, needs battery cable. Another document recovered in McVeigh's car read, quote, when the government fears the people, there is liberty. When the people fear the government, there is tyranny. Jennifer also told jurors that McVeigh wrote the note underneath the quote from the Turner Diaries, maybe now there will be blood. Jennifer also identified her brother's handwriting on the order form for Ragnar's recipe for homemade C4. After authenticating the handwriting on some of those key documents, prosecutors went through a set of letters that McVeigh wrote to her in the months and days leading up to the bombing. The letters revealed McVeigh's growing preoccupation and increasing paranoia about gun control efforts, Ruby Ridge and Waco, and his view of our Constitution. He continued to discuss also the Turner Diaries. In one letter, he mentioned that he had a, a, quote, a network of friends that she could trust. The names of those friends, Michael, Terry, and Lori. In November of 1994, McVeigh came home to New York, at least according to Lori, and according to her, his appearance had changed. He was dressed up, quote, like a biker. He told his sister it was one of his disguises and that he uses fake names like Tim Tuttle. He showed her a video called Day 51, the same video that he showed Lori and Michael Fortier. And the video depicts the government raid of the Branch Davidian compound near Waco. He expressed great anger that the government murdered the people there, basically gassing them, he told his sister. He held the ATF and the FBI responsible and felt that someone should be held accountable. On this same trip, McVeigh used her brother word processor and typed a letter to the American Legion. For the younger folks, a word processor is similar to a a mechanical typewriter, except that the documents could be edited before being printed and were stored on disks. One letter read in part, quote, We members of the citizens' militias do not bear our arms to overthrow the Constitution, but to overthrow those who pervert the Constitution, if and when they once again draw first blood. The ATF are a fascist federal group infamous for depriving Americans of their liberties, as well as other constitutionally guaranteed inalienable rights, such as one's right to self-defense. Citizens' militias will hopefully ensure that violations of the Constitution by these power-hungry stormtroopers of the federal government will not succeed again. After all, who else would come to the rescue of those innocent women and children at Waco? She next told jurors about a conversation she had with her brother while they were driving in town. He told her that he had almost gotten into an accident. He was in a truck going downhill and almost couldn't stop. And the reason? Well, the truck was loaded, according to what she told jurors, with 2,000 pounds of explosives. She didn't ask him why he was carrying those explosives because she told jurors, I I didn't think that I wanted to know. McVeigh left home in December of 1994. A few weeks later, she received a package from him containing a bunch of political materials. The note accompanying those materials said, Jennifer, go ahead and read all the paperwork in this envelope. It's not priority reading, so go through it whenever you have time. Save it along with everything else in this box. In case of alert, call Mike Fortier. Jenny, this is serious. No being lazy. Use a payphone and take a roll of quarters with you. They will, without a doubt, be watching you and tapping the phone. Note, read back cover of the Turner Diaries before you begin. End quote. 
She received another letter that she described for jurors from her brother in early 1995 in which he said that, quote, something big was going to happen in the month of the bull. According to an astrology book, she said, the month of the bull, well, that was April. He also told her in that letter that she should stay on her spring break vacation longer. If she did, that would cover the date of April 20th, 1995. He concluded by telling her to burn the letter after she received it. She did just that. On March 25th, 1995, she received a very ominous letter that read in part, quote, Send no more letters after the 1st of April, and then, even if it's an emergency, watch what you say because I may not get it in time, and the G-men might get it out of my mailbox incriminating you. Enjoy your vacation, T. The last note she received was a very short one contained three to four clippings from the Turner Diaries. She kept it and prepared to leave for vacation in Pensacola, Florida. Before she left on vacation, she separated all the things that belonged to her brother into two boxes, one for memorabilia and the other she described as political literature. In the memorabilia box, she put his army stuff, yearbooks, and other similar personal items. In the second box, she put his political writings, including John Locke's second treatise, an article named The American Response to Tyranny, and another article called Whatever Happened to Liberty Day, along with some VHS tapes of his. She put the memorabilia box in her closet. She gave the second box with the political writings to her good friend Rose for safekeeping while she went on vacation. She explained why. Because from what had been indicated, I thought something might happen while I was on vacation. She was in Florida the day of the bombing. She heard about it while in the car with her friend. She immediately burned the last letter her brother sent her as well as the accompanying Turner Diary excerpts. It wasn't long before the FBI found her and Although she initially lied to them and denied knowing things that she really did know, she relented eventually in revealing the conversation she had with her brother about the explosives as well as the note and the burn clippings. The problem for her is that lying to investigators and destroying evidence are crimes that could land her in prison. And even though she didn't want to testify against her brother, she was left with no choice. Just like with Lori Fortier, prosecutors gave her immunity from prosecution. Timothy McVeigh's attorney, Robert Nye, began his cross-examination of Jennifer McVeigh, Tim's sister, by seizing the opportunity to humanize his client through her. It was obvious she loved her brother still and didn't want to hurt him. Mr. Nye focused the beginning of his cross on McVeigh's impressive military service. McVeigh received the Army Commendation Medal, one that he received for, quote, meritorious achievement with valor during Operation Desert Storm, while assigned as an infantryman to Team Alpha Task Force 216 on the 25th day of February 1991 in southern Iraq. Next, Mr. Nye pointed out that McVeigh didn't ask her to give those political writings to her friend. She did that on her own. She didn't see him write the letter to the ATF, and he never talked about it. What about the Turner Diaries? And all the times he mentioned the book to his sister, he never mentioned anything about building a truck bomb or using ammonium nitrate, nitromethane, or anhydrous hydrazine. From the beginning of the trial, it became apparent that the defense's theme was that the FBI developed tunnel vision on McVeigh at great expense to fairness and objectivity. In this vein, Mr. Nye concluded his cross-examination by having Jennifer relay her experience at the FBI in the days immediately following the bombing. She told jurors that she was interrogated at the FBI for eight or nine hours a day and didn't have a lawyer. In the offices, she described these huge posters of her and her brother on the wall. Underneath both were a number of charges listed out. They showed her the text of some of those criminals' charges. Whoever commits an offense against the United States or aids, abets, counsels, commands, induces, or procures is punishable as a principle. And underneath that, according to her... One of the agents wrote, i.e. death. They also read her the statute on treason, telling her that she could be charged with that too. And the penalty they underlined in that code for her? Death. On the next episode, jurors learn about that calling card with the 1-800 number, how it was used, and the calls it made in the months leading up to the bomb. And the prosecution calls one of McVeigh's accomplices, a man who compared himself to Cato Kalin and boasted that he had quite a tale to tell. Visit amurderousdesign.com and explore this case by subject or by witness by using the Interactive Trial Visualization Report. This is Timothy James McVeigh versus the USA. I'm Brandon Birmingham. 